Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing recent changes to supervised drug injection sites in Ontario, with a policy announcement that these sites will no longer be permitted close to schools. We're joined now by Matt Bufton of the Institute for Liberal Studies, who's recently written in the National Post about the need not for decriminalization, but for full drug legalization. Matt, thanks for joining us. Let me hear your case for full legalization. Thanks for having me, Christine. I think that the case for legalization really has two elements. And one of them is just a sort of moral element that, you know, as consenting adults, we should have the rights to consume the substances that uh, we choose to. And it's not the business of other people to come and tell us not to have alcohol, not to have caffeine, not to eat, you know, fatty fast foods. And I would expand this to other substances that people may want to use that you or I, you or I may think are, are not healthy. We may not want to use them ourselves, but it's not our place to you know, forcibly stop other people from using those substances. Then there's a second sort of more utilitarian argument, which is how effective are we going to be if we make those demands of people, and I'm going to say not very effective. I think we've seen this. We've had a long period in this country and other countries of drug prohibition where people are not allowed to buy or possess or consume these substances. Um, and if you know, making those commands and prohibitions was effective, then we wouldn't have people addicted to hard drugs that we see. We try to make them illegal. It doesn't work. We can't stop people using them. And the illegality actually makes them worse. It is harder to be an addict of, uh, of a hard drug, a heroin, cocaine, these things that are illegal than a legal substance like alcohol. I can use caffeine or tobacco as examples of, uh, of substances that people can have addiction problems with. We don't try to address that by making them completely illegal. We have them within a legal framework. So one of the things that you've argued is that the social problems that we see around social injection sites, including uh, discarded drug paraphernalia like needles, the concentration of criminal dealers, the concentration of people who are on drugs and are unstable, likely suffering from mental illness, as well as the crime we see concentrating, including that horrific murder that we discussed in the last segment. And you say that that's because these these problems are concentrated around those sites, but why wouldn't we expect to see areas where drug users concentrate even if there is full legalization, for example, under uh, bridge overpasses? Well, I think under legalization, there would be no reason to congregate under a bridge overpass, right? Like you don't see people drinking coffee or smoking cigarettes or drinking beers under bridge overpasses. I mean, maybe sometimes, but that's not principally where they are, right? They're in lots of places spread out throughout a city. So the analogy I like to make is what happens if we sort of like kind of banned alcohol, but then we said we're going to have like 10 bars in the city of Toronto. And then all the people who want to use alcohol, at least you know, legally and perhaps safely, had to be in those areas. They would get much, much worse. Now, of course, there's the degree of concentration, right? There are districts with more bars. People who consume alcohol tend to congregate around bars. But there are, I assume, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of places serving alcohol in the city of Toronto. And so people are more spread out. They're more uh, con more dispersed and less concentrated and that is going to make the problems lesser now it doesn't mean there's never a problem with a bar but it does make it a lot better i think than if there were only you know 10 or 20 of these places so you've made the comparison between alcohol and uh, these drugs and doug ford was recently asked about this difference he was asked about the expansion of alcohol into corner stores and how he reconciles his decision between expanding alcohol sales and restricting supervised drug injection sites. And he rejected that comparison, saying that there just is no comparison between a fentanyl and a Coors Light. Um, so why do you think that that is a fair comparison? And what do you make of the argument that it's not? I think we can absolutely make a comparison. Now, of course, these are different substances. There's all sorts of differences that we could discuss. But part of the situation is that when we ban something, we have a really strong incentive to you know, sell it and to consume it in its most powerful form. 
So this is why fentanyl is so popular as a street drug because it's incredibly powerful, incredibly small quantities you can smuggle and sell them for high prices. You might think of this in the consequence to or in relation to a drug pro, uh, alcohol prohibition. If we had alcohol prohibition, would people be drinking Coors Light? No, there'd probably be a lot more emphasis on like liquor, maybe you know vodka that you get up to 98, 99, whatever the highest percentage you can get is, because it just makes more sense to consume it that way. When you consume it that way, you have problems. And of course, the illegality is a, its own problem. Even in a system of uh, decriminalization like we have, there is no legal way to produce and sell it. And I think that's mm -hmm. a key problem. We've got to go to commercial break, but we'll continue right after this.